My name is Liz Kirchhoff and I'm an adult services librarian at the Barrington Area Library. Um, I want to take a moment to thank you all for joining us tonight in our program in partnership with the Chicago Living Corridors. Before we get started, I'd like to ask that all of you please mute your microphones and keep them muted during the program. Uh, if you have some questions, just add those to the chat box and we'll get to just as many of those as we can at the end. Um, the program, as you probably already saw, is being recorded. I'm usually able to send that out by about midweek, the week following. So by about next Wednesday or so, I'll email you all the link to those videos um, and you'll find it on YouTube. Um, now I'd like to go ahead and introduce Peggy Simonson. Peggy's been a volunteer with Citizens for Conservation for 16 years. She's a former president of CFC and continues to serve on the board of directors. Peggy is currently chair of CFC's Community Education Committee. Peggy? Thanks so much, Liz. Um, Kath, Caitlin, if you can put up our first slide. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about Chicago Living Corridors. Some of you who have been seeing some, several of these uh, videos we've been doing, have heard this message before, but those of you who are new, we need to have you understand who we are. Uh, the mission of Chicago Living Corridors is to focus on property and private ownership uh, in the greater Chicago area. Uh, we have other uh, native plant things going on with public ownership like our forest preserves, but we're primarily focusing on people's homes and yards. Uh, and, and then we are uh, created a map of private property that has already been developed as quality habitat in the greater Chicago area. This map is available on our website, chicagolivingcorridors.org, and the, the different colors of the dots uh, represent the different organizations who are helping people, uh, advising on, on creating better habitat. Uh, this green area is around Barrington, that's Citizens for Conservation's territory. Uh, the pink ones that are scattered wide around here is the uh, McHenry County Wildflower uh, Preservation and Propagation Committee that does site visits and so on. If you go on to the next slide, I, we've got a list of these organizations. Uh, the founding organizations were the ha Citizens for Conservation, WPPC, as I mentioned, uh, the Conservation Foundation, which has the program Conservation at Home, and two Wild Ones chapters. And then after the founding, we also have these additional organizations join us, join Chicago Living Quarters. And in, 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 in all cases, they are uh, groups that do site visits so that uh, you, we, they can help you implement what we're talking about in all of our seminars to get, uh, we don't, we don't dig, the, dig in the dirt for you, but we ad, indeed advise on uh, if there's invasives that need to be removed and what kinds of plants, which it's all native plants, but which ones would, would work in your particular habitat and on good habitat management practices as well. Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So we want to invite you to uh, plant natives uh, and, and then join one of these participating organizations. And they are, by the way, all of this is listed on our chicagolivingcorridors.org website, which is right here. Um, if, you want, if you already have good habitat and you want to get your dot on the map, you need to do that through one of these organizations. We're not doing it by you know, one, one individual at a time, but by, by groups. And we, we also are welcome volunteers to work with Chicago Living Corridors. So uh, we hope that you will get inspired today uh, about our program and uh, continue to improve the habitat in your own property and advise and help others do, to do the same. So now I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Caitlin O'Connor is the Education and Outreach, Spe Outreach Specialist at Prairie Moon Nursery. That's a Minnesota business that provides over 700 species of North American native plants for gardening and restoration. In her role, she travels throughout the Midwest, inspiring gardeners to be part of the collective effort to nurture and sustain the living landscape. Mrs. O'Connor is also a horticulture educator with the University of Wisconsin Extension in Jackson and Trempealeau counties. She lives on a homestead in rural Winona and is a member of Wiscoy Valley Community Land Cooperative where Prairie Moon Nursery began. 
Caitlin's going to take you behind the scenes at Prairie Moon Nursery for a great perspective on the production of native seeds and plants. So we're lucky to have Caitlin with us tonight. See her. Thanks so much for the introduction, Peggy. And thanks everyone for coming out tonight to um, be a part of this presentation. I'm really looking forward to sharing um, some more of the behind the scenes with Prairie Moon with you all. Um, so for those of you who aren't familiar, Prairie Moon is an online retailer. We're a mail order nursery um, and we sell a over 700 species of native plants. And we have seed, bare roots, and potted plants. And so we're going to be going over a little bit more about how we produce uh, these different types of products um, that get mailed right to your door. So to start off, we wanna talk a little bit more about Wiscoy Valley Community Land Cooperative. And Wiscoy Valley is kind of where Prairie Moon all began. And Wiscoy is a land cooperative that began in 1976. And so this was a period of time where there was political turmoil and um, social injustices and, you know, a time not unlike our own. And there was a big back to the land movement um, in the 1970s and Wiscoy Valley was kind of a social experiment um, that came out of that back to the land movement. And so this was a group of hippies, more or less, um, that were the creative types, builders, artists, farmers, primarily, who all came together under the values of having an intentional community that was built around land stewardship, social justice, and consensus decision making. So this was an old dairy farm that is 364 acres. And currently there is 12 households and many people who work at Prairie Moon um, and all of the people who founded Prairie Moon are um, living at Wiscoy Valley Land Cooperative, including myself. So Prairie Moon didn't start right away um, when Wiscoy Valley co-op began. Um, initially, the, the way that folks were making money off of the land was through grain farming. Um, so there was a group of organic farmers from Iowa who came up to Minnesota, and we called them the Sunshine Boys. That's what they're known as, because um, they lived on, uh, their farm used to be on a road called Sunshine Lane. So they were the Sunshine Boys. And they knew how to do grain farming. And so a lot of the old land, um, was used for grain farming. But after a few years, turns out it's kind of marginal land in Wiscoy Valley. It's really not the best farmland. And so with low yields and them not being as successful as they would really hoped they would with that farming endeavor, there started to be more of a brainstorm about, okay, well, if we can't be grain farmers, then what can we do to make a living off of the land that still aligns with our philosophical values about land stewardship. Um, and so Prairie Moon Nursery began in 1982 and it was started by Alan Wade um, at first in his living room, um, just as a very small business. Um, and the way that it started was actually with Alan's parents. So Alan's parents are Doug and Dot Wade. And if any of you have been living around the Chicagoland area um, for a long period of time, you may be familiar with them. They actually have a number of prairies um, that are actually named after them or little areas because they were such staunch conservationists and they did such wonderful work um, in the Northern Illinois area. Um, and Doug Wade, who is in the black and white photo that you see on this slide, um, he was actually a graduate student of Aldo Leopold. And I bet a lot of you will recognize the name Aldo Leopold, but just in case you're not familiar with him and his work, um, he is probably one of the most famous conservationists um, kind of up there with like John Muir um, and like Rachel Carson, at least in my book, you know, some of these 
environmental thought leaders. Um, and Aldo Leopold, he worked for the University of Wisconsin. Um, and he was really the first one to, to have this idea that, you know, there is so much habitat destruction. There is so much habitat destruction that, you know, if we're really going to make an impact, if we are going to restore all of this habitat, you know, it can't just be a few academics and their grad students, you know, collecting seed and trying to do this restoration work on a larger effort. There needs to be nurseries. This needs to be something that is done at a larger scale, a commercial scale, so that these types of plants are available for people. Um, Cause at that time, you know, there weren't a lot of plants, native plants that were available for sale and, and still it can be challenging to find native plants for sale. Um, and so Doug and Dot were really inspired by Aldo Leopold and his work. And they really did a lot of the original seed collection under the tutelage of Aldo Leopold. And they started their very own um, native plant nursery that I believe was called Windrift Prairie Nursery. And that was also out of their living room. Um, and so they did that for a little while, um, but then kind of passed on that business model and that knowledge to their son, Alan. Um, and they actually even, you know, helped, helped the community build this uh, structure. You can see here this like, um, this this structure with like the stone um, the stone wall there that's actually um, the very first Prairie Moon office building official office building um, and I'll hear some of the photos of the early days and so um, we've got Jerry up in the corner um, with Yaro talking to Dot Wade um, Gail, who is still our chief financial officer um, down doing accounting back when it was all done on typewriters um, and paper files and, um, you know, here um, up in the very top right hand corner, um, that man that you see there with the glasses and the goatee, that's Bill Carter. He's the current president of Prairie Moon. Um, and so a lot of these folks um, Actually, like everyone who is pictured here besides Doug and Dot, um, they're folks who are still associated with Prairie Moon Nursery and are um, also members of Wiscoy Valley Community Land Cooperative. And so here's some more pictures of the early days um, when Prairie Moon was just getting started. So here you can see more of uh, what the original office building of Prairie Moon looked like. It was just kind of this little log cabin and all of the business happened on the top floor. So that's where everything was like packaged and shipped and where the phone was. There was only one phone at Prairie Moon for a really long time. Um, no computers for the longest time. Um, and then all of the seed storage and seed cleaning was in the basement of this building, which now seems crazy considering how much Prairie Moon has grown um, in the past 40 years. But it all used to happen out of that one little building um, and here you can also see the beginning of the bare root gardens at Prairie Moon, which is this big extensive um, garden on the side of a bluff. And it's very much, it's just like raised garden beds. You can see this, um, how it's on a slope. So it's like tiered raised garden beds. Um, and having it on a slope is actually really beneficial because we can have drier species at the top of the slope and then wetter species at the bottom of the slope. And you can't see this here, but like in between um, where these gardens and that red barn is in the background, there is a little creek, a little stream, a little trout stream that runs through there. And so um, there's actually quite a moisture gradient in this area. And so we've come a long ways from the very beginning days of Prairie Moon. Um, back in 2008 is when Prairie Moon um, purchased a farm on a neighboring property. It's about a mile away. So um, Prairie Moon is in the Driftless region. So it's very hilly, unlike, unlike a lot of areas um, around the Midwest. So lots of topography changes. So Wiscoy Valley, of course, started Prairie Moon started in the valley and then a 40 acre farm. Um, up on the top of the ridge came for sale. And so we purchased that, um, 
that dairy farm. And then that is where the headquarters of Prairie Moon is now located. And so you can see here, we have um, a big um, office and warehouse facility. Don't even know, just so many times <laughs> larger than the original office building, um, plus a really large um, solar panel array. We are able to produce as much energy as we use um, on average, but we are still in, we still need supplemental electricity in the winter time when um, we're cleaning a lot more seeds. And we'll see later in the presentation, a lot of the machines that we use to clean the seed, but that takes a lot of energy. Um, but I think it's really cool that Prairie Moon um, is thinking about sustainability and ecological ideas, not only as it relates to native plants, but also concepts like clean energy and um, providing your own electricity. And then we are in the process of even more expansions. Um, so originally here is what you can see was built in 2008. And then all of these red marks are where Prairie Moon has expanded or is expanding. Um, so on this original one greenhouse building that you see here, we have since built three more greenhouses attached to that. The building attached to the greenhouse is known as the head house and this spring we doubled the size of our head house. We also built a really big pole shed kind of um, off to the left there for more seed storage and seed drying. And then maybe the end of this summer, but probably more realistically in the summer of 2022, we are going to be doing a very large expansion on our um, office, warehouse, and shipping facilities that will be twice as large, but actually three stories. It'll have a basement, um, a main level, and then also a mezzanine level, um, again, for lots of seed storage and seed cleaning. So Prairie Moon is predominantly known as a seed house. We do produce a lot of live plants, um, but we produce a lot of native seed. Um, and so we're gonna talk first about our seed production fields and give you a sense of what this looks like. Um, so here you can see um, some of our field crew members out. And this is a lot of what folks are doing here at Prairie Moon in the summertime. Starting right now, the Carex harvest is going on, um, the sedges, very early seed collection. And then this will happen all the way until November. Folks will be out in the field collecting different types of seed when they are ripe. So here's another idea of what it looks like around Prairie Moon. Um, one of the great things about being in the Driftless region is that the Driftless region is a biodiversity hotspot. And by that, I mean, there is the highest number of species concentrated in this area. Um, and part of that is because of the convergence of a lot of these different habitats, because here in southeastern Minnesota, we have the eastern broadleaf forest, we have the prairies, um, and then we also have the Mississippi River Valley, which has a lot of, you know, wetland areas and riparian areas. And so this biodiversity is a really great thing for us because that gives us access to a lot of different species and a lot of different foundation seed um, that we are then able to plant out and collect. And so here you can see um, a large planting and folks doing some harvesting. And we do a number of different types of plantings. And here you can kind of see the stark difference between the types of plantings that we do. So in the foreground here, what you're seeing is plants plugged into landscape fabric. So, and then in the background, kind of in between that like strip of Penstemon digitalis, that white flowering um, plant that's blooming, just beyond that in the background, those are mixed plantings. And so there are some plants that you can isolate from a plant community and you can, you can take them out and you can grow them out in these, this landscape fabric and that works. And this is for lots of common species like anise hyssop and butterfly milkweed and you know some of those tried and true things that you landscape with all the time. Um, those things, 
can be grown in isolation. And when we can do that, it's more efficient. Um, we can harvest more seed in less time. And you can also use lower skilled workers. So you can just, you know, all these are labeled, you know, one, two, three, four, five. And you can just say, go out to this field and cut all the tops off of the plants in row five. <laughs> and, you know, college kids can go and do that. Um, but when you have a mixed planting, the benefits are that there are quite a number of native plants that they don't really want to grow in isolation. There is something about that plant community that is making that plant happy. Um, and when you try to take it out of that community, it's not going to, it's not, it just doesn't work very well. Um, and also, it's just kind of the general consensus that, you know, we don't really like black plastic. It's not sustainable. Um, we would like to find other methods for, you know, organic management, uh, organic weed management, but it is tough out there. <laughs> um, and so this is kind of the compromise where we can have um, this more organic production, um, but we can we can get that higher efficiency with harvests as, compo as opposed to the more complex plantings that are more of like a true prairie restoration. Because as you can imagine, you know, you need to have skilled people out there, botanists who can ident properly identify the plant. They need to be able to identify the plant while it is in seed. They need to be able to tell if that seed on that individual plant is ripe and ready for the picking. And they need to not contaminate their bags with other seeds. And as you're walking through a tall prairie, it's a lot harder to keep that seed clean um, in a mixed planting. But both of these strategies for producing seed are very important to the business. So here you can see more. This is an allium species. And they're just going through and weeding this right now. And even though the black plastic does, you know, this landscape fabric helps a lot with weeds, um, I would say like at least 50% of the field crew is just weeding, just weeding, 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 uh, hand weeding everything. <laughs> um, and when we're doing seed harvest, um, we often go through multiple times because the seed is going to ripen at different times you know everything isn't going to be ready all at once oftentimes seed will like start ripening from the top down or the bottom up or depending on where the sun hits the plant it'll be ripe in some spots but not others um, so that also means that we're going through these fields multiple times to be sure that we're capturing all of of those different seed ripenings um, and we also do that to try and capture as much genetic variability as possible we could just go through and hit all the fields once, but then you're kind of just getting those peak, um, those peak genetics. And it's, you know, for us, we were really interested in, you know, maximizing genetic diversity and, you know, trying to get stuff at the beginning, you know, the early ripeners and the late ripeners as well. And so oftentimes in production, we are taking shade plants and taking them out of the forest and growing them in full sun. So this is an interesting thing where sometimes on our website, you'll see photos of plants that normally only occur in woodlands, but our photo is of like a very sunny spot. Um, and part of that is because we are, you know, using contraptions like these, like caterpillar tunnels with shade cloths um, so that we can take these, these woodland species and produce them on a production size scale outside of the woods, which also makes things very complicated if you're doing things in the woods. Um, so that's kind of an interesting component here. So here you can see Jacob's Ladder, um, and then we've got Bishop's Cap um, and the Bellwort that is underneath this caterpillar tunnel. And we also do, um, large plantings of certain species. This is a rose milkweed field in the valley that just seems to go on forever. And here we've got some more species. And then this is our Echinacea pallida field, which is blooming right now and just turns the whole ridge line pink, <laughs> which is really interesting to see. And then oftentimes these are we kind of have a hybrid too, where, you know, it's not a single species planted like this. 
and it's not a true restoration planting either. It'll kind of look like this during one time of the year, but maybe there's only like five species planted, but they their seed ripens at a different time of the year. And so it's really easy to just go through uh, at once and like get a whole bunch of seed. And so here's the field crew plugging in a new production bed. And then we have our greenhouses. So for our greenhouses um, for plant propagation, we oftentimes we'll seed the trays like this and then we have like a giant walk-in cooler where instead of doing our stratification in the fridge we actually do a lot of this labor for seeding trays um, like in the dead of winter and then just put these whole trays into this walk-in cooler to do the stratification and then probably the end of february beginning of march that's when you turn one of the bays in this greenhouse complex into what we call the germination chamber. Um, so you can see we've walled it off with plastic and then we just heat this one section of the greenhouse while things are the smallest in their 288 trays. And then we cram everything in this one room um, to get things germinating while they're all still small. And then as things grow and we pot on species into bigger and bigger um, trays, then we'll expand out into more of the greenhouse space. And so here's a picture when the seedlings are a little bit bigger, they've been potted on. And then here's kind of an action shot of as you know we're getting orders ready, we are pulling plants out of the greenhouse, getting orders and different plant species on these big carts um, that we can then roll into the head house and then package up for shipping and getting them out the door. And so next we have our bare root gardens. And so, you know, a, a lot of the plants that we are growing in the greenhouse, we do grow for retail sale, um, but we're also growing a lot of our own plants for then further production, um, not only seed production, but also bare root production. And so we will take these little plants and line them out in our raised garden beds outdoors um, and grow those bare roots for at least one year up to seven years depending on the species and sales. So here's a better idea of like up close kind of what the bare root gardens look like when you're down there. Um, and so you can see there's different species that we have in each different bed. They're all labeled um, so that we know which is which. And then, you know, when you order a bare root from Prairie Moon, this is where we're going to get them. <laughs> and so when we get our orders um, in the fall, it will be the next time that we go, um, we will go out to these bare root gardens and dig up the plants while they're dormant. Um, when we dig the plants in the fall, they look more like this um, after they've been dug up and washed and trimmed. And then we pack these in peat moss and that is what you get when you order bare roots from Prairie Moon. And the thing that's nice about these is that they are older plants and they're grown outdoors. Um, so they're a little bit hardier, like you don't need to do things like hardening off, you know, you can, you can plant them while it's snowing <laughs> in the spring or in the fall and you know, they're good to go. So speaking of things that happen in the fall, um, fall is predominantly when the seed harvest happens. Um, and this is perhaps one of my favorite fields at Prairie Moon. Um, this is um, Liatris ligulostylus, the meadow blazing star. We also have prairie onion and uh, anise hyssop that are planted in here. So the, the prairie onion is the light purpley pink. Um, and the anise hyssop is kind of like right in the middle row where those three guys are, are harvesting. And so here's where you can see again where it's like these plants look like they are in full bloom, but there's actually a number of individuals, um, especially in that anise hyssop row, it's kind of, you know, it's starting to fade. Um, and so they're collecting some of those first seeds to ripen on those plants there. And so the vast majority of all the seed that is harvested at Prairie Moon is hand harvested, just like this. And so as you can see, you know, it's a lot easier for 
us to be able to just go out and cut seed off of you know plants when they're organized in these nice clean rows like this um, and when we're we're going out and doing the diversified prairies um, then you're being much more selective it's a lot slower work it's more skilled work um, but sometimes it's nice to just slow down and you know experience being out in the prairie and harvesting those um, those ripe seeds but there are some species that we are able to harvest by combine and we're experimenting more and more with this, especially as we get larger and larger and get more and more ecotypes available. Um, hand harvesting is a lot of work <laughs> and it's really slow. And so if there are some species right now, this is predominantly grass species that we're able to harvest by combine. Um, but we are experimenting with other species to be able to harvest by combine um, so that we can get a much larger scale of um, seed out there, especially for some of these more common species that are really easy to grow out in, you know, old agriculture fields. And then once we harvest the seed, then you have to dry the seed. And so oftentimes, um, you know, we are going out in the field and we're basically just cutting the whole top of the plant off. So you can see that, yes, the seed head is in here, but there's a lot of other vegetation that is like mixed up in into all of these harvests. And so seed drying is important um, because moisture is essentially the enemy of the seed. Uh, moisture often leads to mold and mold will eat your seed. And so for the vast majority of species, having dried seed is very, very important. Um, and it also makes cleaning the seed easier as we move to the next steps um, within the process. Another thing that's important about seed drying is that oftentimes with a lot of species, when the seed is ripe, like truly ripe and ready, the plant releases it. And that makes sense, right? I mean, like once the seed is ready to go, the, the plant wants to get that seed away from the mother plant, that it wants to release the seed, which totally makes sense from a plant's perspective. But if you're trying to harvest that seed, it makes it difficult um, because as soon as you're ready to go, you go and harvest that seed and then it drops. And I'll tell you what, there has been times where we have been too late at harvesting. You know, we're the, you know, it just it got hotter faster, it ripened faster than we thought it would. And we go out to some of these strips and as we're cutting the plants, the seed is just dropping on the ground, dropping, dropping, dropping. And a lot of times we don't have other plantings. Like this is this is the production field for the species for the year. And <laughs> the guys have literally brought shop vacs out into the field and like shop vacked up <laughs> the the production field to like get the seed that has fallen on the ground. Um, so it's much, much easier if you can avoid that shop vacking the field situation. Um, and if you can harvest the seed just a little bit early where it's almost ripe, but not quite ripe, and what's gonna happen is when you cut it off the plant and if you leave it out in the sun to dry like this, it's gonna ripen off the plant. It, the seed will finish ripening here. And then underneath this big pile is a tarp. And so if the seed falls out at that point, it's not a big deal, we've got it in the tarp and then we can move on to the next step. So this is what it looks like for larger harvests. And then for smaller harvests um, for species, you know, that are more niche or have a very specific type of require or of habitat. We're just using smaller um, boxes like this. Um, and we have a number of different types of ways to dry the seed, but essentially it's either like tarps or little kids swimming pools or plywood boxes with fans or low ones like this without fans that just evaporate in the sun. Um, and then it's always really important um, that the seed is stirred or agitated at least once a day. Um, and that again is to prevent mold and to get these to dry evenly before seed goes to cleaning, which is the next step. And this is the noisiest and messiest part <laughs> of the whole process here. 
Um, so seed cleaning is the process of separating the seed from the rest of the plant parts. And we have a number of machines that help us do this, but they're all homemade. <laughs> there's not really, there's not really commercial agricultural equipment out there to clean prairie seed. And so we have, and really I should say Humphrey is predominantly the person who has done this for us throughout the years. It's very mechanically inclined and will take pieces of farming equipment like clippers and fanning mills that are used to clean other types of agricultural seed and then has retrofitted them and modified them in order so that we can use them for our purposes. And mostly what we're doing when we retrofit these machines is screens, lots and lots and lots of screens. I should have added a photo of the screen wall um, <laughs> at Prairie Moon, but there is a whole wall that is just like a million different types of screens. And some of them are slitted screens and some of them are just like regular screens that you buy at the hardware store. Some of them are really special sheets of metal. Um, I don't know, there's all sorts of different types of screens and that you can put into these machines and then based upon what species you have, um, there is a giant Excel spreadsheet in this, in this seed room that's on the wall that tells you which series of machines to use and what settings those machines need to be on in order to clean the seed. And the folks who've been cleaning seed at Prairie Moon have been doing this for like decades and they can do it super fast and super good. And that's one of the things that Prairie Moon really likes to pride itself on um, is that we have really clean seed and we always wanna produce the cleanest seed possible so that, you know, when you buy one ounce of seed from Prairie Moon, you're really getting one ounce of just seed. There's no other little plant bits in it. There's no other species in there that shouldn't be in there. You know, you, you're always getting what you bargain for. And so that was indoor seed cleaning. And we also do um, a lot of seed cleaning outdoors, especially with the larger quantities of things. And so um, we have a number of machines that can actually be like hooked up to the back of a tractor um, or other machinery that can be used outside. Um, and so here you can see the guys working on a little larger scale. Um, and that's what some of our expansion is going to be for later this year or in 2022 is to really bump up the machinery that we use to clean the seeds so that we can clean a lot more seed faster because we oftentimes run out of room for things. And it's like a, it's like a mass shuffle because <laughs> it's like everything needs to go outside during the day. But then if it ever rains or if it gets windy or just at the end of the day, all of this seed needs to come back inside of a pole shed somewhere or a barn somewhere or a building somewhere. Um, and so as we produce more and more seed, we're running out of buildings. Um, <laughs> and so hopefully once we get this new expansion uh, on our warehouse, we'll have a lot more space for a lot more seed. And when the seed is cleaned, it looks like this. <laughs> I was um, chatting with some folks before we started and saying that Prairie Moon is a dog friendly office. We're also a kid friendly office and oftentimes kids are here. Um, and the seed cleaning is often irresistible to jump in like a pile of leaves. And once the seed is all cleaned and packaged up, this is what it looks like in our seed warehouse. Um, so this is our climate controlled seed storage facility. And each one of these bags has a specific lot or a specific type of seed. Um, and it is organized alphabetically by scientific botanical name. And then um, the bags that are like in front of each other are all different ecotypes. So for some species, we maybe only have one ecotype, but for other species, we maybe have six, seven, eight different ecotypes. And then we have long-term storage. Basically with seed, it's like the cooler and the drier 
you keep the seed, the longer it will last. But like people have to work in this room every day, like Monday through Friday, nine to five. So like it can't be a freezer in this room. So we try to, it's cold, but it's, you know, it's like sweatshirt and jeans cold. Um, you, and then, whoopsies. And then this room, this room is much colder. And so people only go in there if, you know, they're, they're like restocking this. This is where a lot of the bulk seed um, will, will hang out until we're ready to use it. And then really, you know, with the seed warehouse, um, a lot, you know, we're doing a lot of shipping. We ship right from our own facilities and, you know, this I'm sure looks like a lot of other businesses um, because, you know, even though we are producing um, live plants here at Prairie Moon, we're in a lot of ways, it's just kind of like a seed factory and this is the warehouse and the shipping stations. Um, so we have to deal with a lot of, you know, things that a lot of other mail order businesses are dealing with, with postage and, you know, delays in shipping and um, things like that. Um, but it's really the people that make it all happen. And this is this is the crew um, of the of Prairie Moon who, you know, makes things run and gets all of these seeds and plants out to your door. And I will say it's it is a fun group of people and I love working at Prairie Moon. And it's one of those things where you always want to have your career ambitions align with your philosophies and to be a part of this crew who is bringing native plants um, to the folks of the upper Midwest is, you know, something that feels very rewarding. And it's really awesome when you can have fun in the meantime. Um, so thank you so much for all of your attention. Um, I think next uh, we are going to be doing some questions and answers, but Peggy, I don't know if you had um, a couple of announcements about some June garden events or things, if you wanted to chime in before we start to do Q and A. Yes, uh, just wanted you to have, a, if Caitlin has offered her contact information, if you have, uh, specific questions afterward, although we have time for uh, handling a number of questions now, just in a minute. Make sure that you know about the Chicago Living Corridors website, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and, and uh, it, you, can, you can ask questions of us too. Um, Carol Rice is usually the one who answers them for us. We have a pretty active, Carol's doing a really nice job with, with Facebook posts, so uh, look for that if you're on Facebook as well. Um, and you can sign up to get our e-newsletters by, by going on our website. I didn't mention earlier, but I want to now. Uh, the website is really a wealth of information. So if you're wanting to know about specific plants, there are plant lists there. Uh, there are steps for if you're just getting started with planting with native plants. Uh, there's just a, a whole a lot of valuable information. and. Under resources on the website, we have uh, videos, uh, recordings of all of the previous uh, webinars that we've done for the last year now, uh, specifically on birds, on uh, dragonflies, on every kind of topic you can imagine. So take a look at those, and they're about uh, just a little less than an hour each. And if you've even if you've seen one before, you might want to go back and, and refresh some of the details. The value of that is you don't have to take lots of notes while you're watching, you can just come back and, and, and pick up the pieces afterward. So there's that. Uh, right now, I will also mention our next uh, program coming up in August, if you can advance the slide for me. This is again about seeds, but the next one is going to be about how you can collect your own seeds and, and sow them. Uh, and it, Sarah <clears throat> McCall is, is uh, with the Land Conservancy of McHenry County and an expert on this. So uh, we think it's timely in August to be able to uh, think about if you have native plants growing, how you do collect and, and then sow your native seeds and which ones need to be uh, stratified as, as Caitlin was talking about, kept cold during the winter and so forth. Sometimes, uh, with the native plants, we plant them right away because that's what nature does. As soon as the seeds pop off, they get into the soil. So anyway, everything you can you want to know about how to collect and sow your native plant seeds in August. Note that we are not doing a July uh, program. 
Uh, we think a lot of people are not at home or out doing enjoy the, enjoying the summer. So uh, our next program will be on August. And if you're on this mailing list, you'll get another, you'll get a notice of this one coming up.